أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Lesson number 242 سورة صاد آية number 41-88 واذكر عبدنا أيوب and remember our servant أيوب إذ نادى ربه when he called to his Lord أني مسني الشيطان بنصب وعذاب that indeed shaytan has touched me with hardship and also torment. وَذْكُرْ عَبَدَنَا And mention our servant. The Prophet ﷺ, the listener, the one who is being addressed, is being told to remember the servant of Allah, Ayyub ﷺ. Why? In order to take a lesson from his life. In order to take a lesson from his story. Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to remember something, to mention something, what does it show? That there is a great lesson for us in that. There is something that is very much relevant to us. We need to reflect on it and see what we can learn from it for ourselves. وَذْكُرْ abadana And mention our servant. Notice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls Ayyub alayhi salam his servant, our servant. Why? Because Ayyub alayhi salam was a very devout worshipper. He proved himself as a true servant of Allah, as a worshipper of Allah, because he worshipped Allah in good times and in bad times. In the state of ease and in the state of difficulty. In the state of health and in the state of illness. And when a person regularly, consistently worships Allah, then what does he show? What is he proving? That he is truly a servant of Allah. When he remembers Allah at all times. And when a person remembers Allah only in certain times, what does it show? What does it show? That he's not really a true servant. Because if you think about it, a slave, when is he obedient to the master? When he feels like it only? When it's convenient for him only? No. He is obedient to the master all the time. Whether it's daytime or nighttime, whether it's weekdays or it's weekends. He is obedient to the master in every respect. So Ayyub alayhi salam, he was also a devout worshipper of Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him Abdana, our servant. So remember him. إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ When he called out to his Lord. Nada nida. What does nida mean? To call out to someone loudly, with a loud voice. And munajat is to call out to someone with a low voice. Nida is to call out loudly. And munajat is to whisper. And when the word nida is used for dua, what does it show? Not that a person is yelling out to Allah, making dua very loudly. No. Nida, when used for dua, means a person is making dua with a lot of desperation. That he's desperately calling on to Allah. So, إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ When he called out to his Lord. And what did he say? What dua did he make? That, أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الشَّيْطَانُ That indeed, shaytan has touched me. Shaytan has afflicted me. With what? بِنُصْبٍ With hardship وَعَذَاب And torment He says that shaitan has touched me Mas is from the root letters Mim seen seen And mas is to touch To feel And the word mas is also used for affliction It's also used in many other ways And the mas of shaitan When shaitan touches someone What does it mean? The effect of shaitan When shaitan Affects a person Obviously the effect of shaitan would be Negative Would be harmful We have learned earlier in Surah Al-Baqarah That those people who consume riba On the day of judgment How will they stand? كَمَا يَقُومُ الَّذِي يَتَخَبَّطُهُ الشَّيْطَانُ مِنَ المس. Like the person Who shaitan has driven him to madness By his touch By his effect that shaitan has touched him, affected him, and as a result that person is driven to madness. He has gone mad, he has gone crazy. So what is the mas of shaitan? The mas of shaitan is of two types. First of all, the effect of shaitan is hissi, meaning physical. 
Shaitan can physically have an effect on the human being. The jinn can have a physical effect on the human beings. It is said that Ayyub alayhi salam, Shaitan physically affected him so that his entire skin erupted with blisters. He had a terrible skin disease and this skin disease was a result of what? The shaitan's effect on him. And we learn from hadith as well that the Prophet ﷺ said that this, meaning the istihada, what is istihada? The bleeding that women have which is outside of the menstrual cycle. So this istihada is a strike caused by shaitan. You understand? So shaitan can have a physical effect on the human being. Sometimes it happens that a person is ill and they cannot figure out what that illness is even. And when you read Ruqya, when you read Quran, then what happens? It goes away gradually. So shaitan can have a physical effect which results in strange ailments, strange diseases that people cannot figure out what they are, what their cause is and they cannot even figure out what the physical cure is to that. Secondly, the must of shaitan, the effect of shaitan is also that which is ma'nawi. Ma'nawi meaning it's intangible. It's the effect that shaitan has on the nafs of a person. On the nafs of the person that shaitan constantly puts waswasa in the heart of a person, in the mind of a person so that a person gets psychologically affected, mentally affected. That for example, constantly shaitan puts negative thoughts in the heart of a person. Negative, negative, negative. So what happens? A person becomes depressed. He suffers from anxiety. He suffers from phobias, fear. I'm not saying that every mental illness, every psychological illness is a result of shaitan's effect, but that shaitan can have a psychological effect on the person. Remember we learned earlier in Surah Al-Mu'minun that Rabbi inni a'udhu bika min hamazat al-shayateen wa a'udhu bika rabbi an yahdurun What are the hamazat of shayateen? When the shaitan constantly puts waswas in the heart of a person. Constantly. Which is why a person gets mentally affected. He cannot think properly. He almost loses his sanity. And many times it is seen that psychological problems are related with shayateen. That a person who is possessed by the jinn is also suffering from a psychological problem as well. Both are many times connected. Because shaitan affects a person and as a result, a person gets mentally affected. So he said, Anni masaniya shaitanu, shaitan has touched me, shaitan has affected me. With what? Bi nusbin wa adab, with distress and torment. What does it mean by nusb? Nusb is from the root letters Noon, Sad, Ba. And Nusb is used for labor. When a person labors a lot, when a person gets tired, and because of that he's unable to stand straight, he's unable to keep his balance, he's exhausted. So what is it a result of? A lot of work, physical fatigue, that is a result of a lot of work. So Nusb is used for exhaustion, fatigue, the state of being tired, so what does it refer to? Bodily affliction. The physical suffering, the physical pain that he was experiencing. And adab, adab from the root letters Ain Zalba, what does adab literally mean? To taste. And adab, this can be physical, it can also be mental. You can experience pain that is physical and you can experience pain that is mental as well. So what does it mean by adab over here? In the context, it refers to pain. That along with the physical ailment, he suffered from physical pain and he suffered from mental pain, emotional affliction. So nusb is what? Physical affliction. And adab is what? Emotional affliction. So shaitan has touched me, has affected me both physically and mentally. How? That because of the effect of the shaitan, his entire skin was diseased. His entire body was ailing. And because of this, 
he was mentally disturbed as well. Because what does shaitan do? When a person is suffering from a physical problem, shaitan comes to a person and starts to make him think very negatively. Allah is very unhappy with you. Where is God? If there was a God, you would not be in this state. Where has all your ibadah gone? You were so good. See, none of your worship brought you any benefit. You're suffering from these problems because of all that worship that you did. This religion has brought you no benefit. So this is what? Mental distress that shaitan causes. And shaitan causes his mental distress to the person and he also causes his mental distress to, to other people who are around him. Like for example, when a person is unwell, shaitan will come and put negative thoughts in his mind. Where is Allah? What crime did I commit? What sin did I commit? Where is Allah's mercy? I've been praying for so long, I have not been cured. And the family members, what do they think? Where is Allah? How come my child is suffering like this? How come my spouse is suffering like this? How come my father is suffering like this? And then when they think like this, when they think negatively, they go and say negative things to the person as well who is suffering from the illness. Like for example, they said about Ayyub that he was a devout worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regularly. He was bestowed with a lot of wealth. He was extremely wealthy and he was also very healthy. And despite the good times, he used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was a prophet of Allah, but he was also a devout worshipper. So what happened? The people started objecting and they began saying, yes, he worships Allah, what's the big deal? He has every reason to worship Allah. He has been given wealth, he has been given servants, he has been given a family, he has a good body. Of course he should worship Allah. So what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him and he took his wealth away from him. He was so wealthy, all that wealth destroyed. Ayyub alayhi salam, he continued in his worship of Allah. And the people, they did not leave him alone again. They did not spare him again. What did they say? They said, of course he should worship Allah. Because at least he has his health. He's not suffering from any physical problems. So what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him again. And Ayyub alayhi salam was suffering from a physical ailment. And as I mentioned to you, it was a skin disease. So then the people started saying negative things about him again. That of course he should worship Allah. That... His wealth has been taken away His health has been taken away He must have done something wrong Because of which he is suffering So when people say such things to you You are suffering because you did something wrong Even if they don't say directly But you hear about it indirectly Does it disturb you? Does it hurt you? It hurts you a lot Then why are people thinking like this? So, Anni masani a shaitan who bin nuspin wa adab. Shaitan, he has afflicted me with physical hardship and also mental distress. Shaitan has really affected me, has really had a bad effect on me. And over here, he ascribes the illness to who? Shaitan. But isn't it so that any illness that a person suffers from is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed it to happen? Allah allowed it to happen But who was the one who had the effect? It was shaitan And when he says that shaitan has affected me This is out of respect for Allah Because evil should not be directly attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Evil should not be directly attributed to Allah So out of respect, out of adab He said Anni masaniya shaitan bin nusbin wa adab And also because of the fact that shaitan was the cause of his illness of the suffering that he had so what happened then he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he made dua to Allah he called out to his Lord he humbled before him and he knew that there was no refuge but with Allah and his heart became free of everything but Allah and what happened then relief came just imagine the distress that he was suffering from physical illness mental distress financial loss and on top of that, his family also had left him. His family also left him. Why did his family leave him? Because many times when a person is suffering from a physical illness, the family is unable to tolerate the person. Sometimes they cannot look after him. They are unable to do so. Sometimes the person is hospitalized. He's alone. If the disease is contagious, people are afraid. 
Right? And many times a person himself cannot look after the family. So the children, they move out because they have to look after themselves, they have to work, they have to travel, they have to go here to there if they want to make money. So his family also left him and he was all alone. And when he called out to his Lord, he was not angry at all. Look at his humility. That anni masani ash-shaytanu bi nusbin wa He doesn't say, Oh Allah, have mercy on me. I'm tired. I'm sick. I'm hurting. I'm exhausted. No, what does he say? Shaytan has affected me. And he's not angry with Allah. He did not have any complaints. He did not make his sorrow evident. But that shaytan has affected me. So you help me. And when he called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this way, then what happened? Relief came. And it was said to him, Urkuk birijilika. So he was told, strike with your foot. Urkuk. From the root letters? Rakafdad. Rakd. Rakadha is to move one's leg. To move one's foot. Or to strike with one's foot or leg. To move, to strike, to kick with one's leg or foot. And it's to strike forcefully with one's foot. And urkub birijalika, strike with your foot. Strike what? The object is not mentioned, but it's understood that strike the ground with your foot. So what happened? He struck the ground with his foot. And he struck how many times? Only once. And as a result, what happened? A cool spring of water gushed forth by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for this cool spring, no drilling was required, no digging was required, nothing like that was required. Rather, one strike with the foot was sufficient. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is able to do all things. Musa alayhi salam also, he struck the rock how many times? Just once. And what happened? Twelve springs gushed out. Jibreel alayhi salam, he struck the ground once with his wings. And what happened? The spring of Zamzam came out. So Ayyub alayhi salam also, he struck the ground just once with his foot. And you can imagine how strong the strike would be of a person who is ailing. It's not that strong. So Urkut birijilika, هَذَا مُغْتَسَلٌ This is a مُغْتَسَل مُغْتَسَل Root letters غَيْن سِيمْ لَامْ غُسُل What does غُسُل mean? To wash To take a bath And مُغْتَسَل This is ظرف Or ism of رُول Meaning One to bathe with The word مُغْتَسَل Is also used for a washroom Because what do you do over there? You wash yourself there So هَذَا مُغْتَسَل Meaning this is water To take a bath from Baridun, one that is cool, and also this is water for the purpose of sharab and drinking. Barid from the root letters baradal, and barad barid is used for something that is cold, but it's not cold to the point of being disturbing, but it's cold in the sense of being comfortable and pleasing. You know, one is that you have cold water, cool water, and the other is that you have ice cold water. If you have ice cold water, it might give you brain freeze. But if you have cold water, don't you enjoy it? You enjoy every sip of it. And if it's warm, do you enjoy it then? You don't enjoy it at all. So, هَذَا مُغْتَسَلٌ بَارِدٌ وَشَرَابٌ It was not freezing cold, but rather it was comfortable cool. And if you think about it, from the earth, hot springs also gush out. Isn't it so? There are also many hot springs. And the water that comes out, it's very high in sulfur. And many times it's used as a cure for various illnesses. It has such properties which help cure many illnesses. But over here we see that Ayyub a.s. he was given cool water. Why do you think so? Why cool and not hot? Because his skin was ailing. And if you put hot water on skin that is broken then isn't it going to further irritate the skin? It's going to. So when the skin was already irritated, cool water is comforting. So he was told to wash his body with that cool water and also to drink that cool water. Because in that cool water was shifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had placed shifa for him in that water. 
Now, if you think about it, Ayub, I'm sure he would have had water before that as well. He would have taken a bath, he would have had water to drink many times, but it did not have the same effect. This time it had the effect. Why? Because Allah placed shifa in that water. So what does it show? That shifa is with who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He can put shifa in anything. It's possible you take one medication after the other. You try one therapy after the other, but it doesn't bring any benefit whatsoever. And you do something so unusual and all of a sudden you're perfectly fine. Because Allah placed shifa in that. Which is why whenever you're taking any kind of medication, make dua that, Ya Allah, put shifa in this for me. Put shifa in this for me. Don't think that shifa is in that thing from before. No, Allah will put shifa in that. So, هَذَا مُغْتَسَلٌ بَارِدٌ وَشَرَابٌ So what happened? He washed himself with that water. And he drank that water as well. And as a result, every ailment that had affected him internally and externally disappeared completely. And you see, he was also mentally disturbed because of the waswasa of shaitan. And when you have cool water to drink, does it calm you down? Does it calm you down? Does it relax you? It relaxes you. So it shows to us that water has healing properties as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put healing properties in water and when a person drinks cool water when he bathes himself when he washes himself then what happens? it's a means of calming him down because anger is like heat fire so when you wash yourself it cools down that fire وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ أَهْلَهُ and we granted him his family وَهَبْنَا لَهُ أَهْلَهُ we granted him his family وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ And the like number with them. مِثْلَهُمْ Similar to them. Similar to who? Similar to his family. مَعَهُمْ Along with them. So in other words, his family was doubled for him. When he was unwell, his family left him. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured him, his family came back to him. His children, they all returned to him. And when they returned to him, his wife returned to him. What happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him more family members. He gave him more children. So his wife gave birth to more children. How many more children? Equal to the number that he had before. So the number of his family members doubled. So, وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ Along with them. It wasn't that the children that he had before, they died. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him more children. No. They came back to him. Some have said that his children, his family, all of them died. This is what he said when he was unwell. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured him, his children were given life again. However, you need some evidence to support this. And there is no evidence. You might find it in the Israeliyat, but you don't find it in the Quran and Sunnah. Because Ihya, Bard al Maut, coming back alive after death in this dunya, there's something very major. Okay, and we cannot just assume that it happened without any evidence. So, وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ أَهْلَهُ His family came back to him, his children returned to him, and they began living with him again. And this is a huge blessing. Because many times when a person is suffering from an illness, he also suffers from loneliness. That his family members cannot stay with him. And this is not necessarily because they don't like him anymore. They can't be bothered to take care of him. They're being ungrateful, so which is why they have left him. No. Sometimes the circumstances don't allow. They don't allow. Like a person is seriously ill. He has to be hospitalized. When he's in the hospital, there are limited hours when his family member can come and visit him. Isn't it so? Similarly, sometimes a person is so sick, he cannot stay at home. Like for example, in this country, for certain people who become extremely ill, The doctor says that the person has to go to a nursing home. The family members say, no, we'll take care of him. But the doctor says that no, she has to go, he has to go. They need full time support. And this cannot be given at home. So when a person is away, is it because his family does not like him anymore? No, it's because his illness is such that does not allow him to be with his family members. He cannot work. He cannot support his family anymore. He has to sell his house. 
So his children have to move out. And when they've moved out, can they be with him anymore? No, they cannot. So, وَوَهَبَنَا لَهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ This was a huge mercy of Allah, that his family members came back to him. And it wasn't just that he had those children only, but rather his wife gave birth to more children, and as a result his family doubled. And this was rahmata minna as mercy from us. وَذِكْرَ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ And also a reminder for who? For those who have intellect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave His health back to him, His wealth back to him, His family back to him. Why? As a mercy from Allah. As a mercy from Himself. This was a mercy of Allah upon him. And also in this is dhikra li ulil albab. Dhikra is more than dhikr. It's a much stronger form of dhikr. Dhikr is just to remember. But dhikra is to take a lesson. When something serves as a huge lesson, a huge reminder. So in the story of Ayyub a.s. is a dhikra li ulil albab. How is it a dhikra? How is it a strong reminder? How is it a big reminder, a big lesson? In which way? That first of all, even the prophets of Allah suffer from trials. It's not only the wicked, the sinful, the ordinary people who suffer from trials in this dunya, who suffer from difficulties in this dunya. But even the prophets of Allah suffered from trials. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he suffered from trials. Isa alayhi salam, Lut alayhi salam. All the prophets of Allah, don't we learn about so much persecution they suffered, difficulties they suffered. Ayyub alayhi salam also suffered from a great trial. So this shows that when a person is suffering from a trial, it's not necessarily because of a sin that he has committed. It's due to other reasons as well. And what is that? That Allah may elevate his ranks. May elevate his ranks to that of the sabiri. Secondly, dhikr, this story is a strong reminder of the fact that shaitan can have a harmful effect on people, even the most righteous of them. So just because shaitan has had a bad effect on a person does not mean that that person does something wrong. That person does not pray, that person listens to music, that person does not keep clean, and as a result shaitan has had an effect on him. No, this is not necessary. Because who was more righteous than the prophets of Allah? No one. They were the most righteous. But still, we see that shaitan had a bad effect on Ayyub a.s. So what should we do? To protect ourselves. What should we do? Keep praying to Allah. Keep praying to Allah. Keep reciting the Quran. Keep reciting Adqa. Du'as for protection. Because shaitan can have an effect on a person. Also, a dhikra, a strong reminder, this incident is, of the fact that when a mutar person turns to Allah with sincerity, then Allah responds. See how Ayyub a.s. turned to Allah? That anni masani shaytanu bi nusbin wa adab. Shaytan has affected me with nusb, with adab. That's all he said. But he said it with sincerity. He really meant it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to him. And this incident is also a strong reminder of the fact that when matters become very difficult, then relief is near. Ayyub a.s. It wasn't that in one day his health, his wealth, everything was taken away from him. No, it happened gradually. But when it got worse, then what happened? Relief came. Isn't it so? Because sometimes what happens? When we are in an extremely difficult situation, we think that's it. We begin to despair. We begin to give up hope of the mercy of Allah. But the fact is that relief is very, very near. And that is a real test. That what do we do at that point? The Prophet ﷺ said, this is a hadith in Musnad Ahmad, that, اِعْلَمُوا أَنَّ النَّصْرَ مَعَ الصَّبْرِ وَأَنَّ الْفَرَجَ مَعَ الْكَرْبِ That faraj relief comes with suffering. It comes with distress. You understand? It only comes after distress. وَأَنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى And with difficulty, there is also ease. So when the difficulty intensifies, know that relief is very, very near. And this incident is also a strong reminder of the fact that shifa, cure, must be obtained through means. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave shifa to him. Isn't it so? But how? Through the cold water. And Ayyub alayhi salam, he had to strike his foot. So this incident is a dhikra, a strong reminder. It gives us many, many lessons. But who will take those lessons? Who will remember them? Ulil albab. Those people who have intellect. Wahud biyadika. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him that take in your hand. Take in your hand what? Dighthan. A bunch of grass. A bunch of twigs. Dighth is from the root that was dad ghain sa. Any other word from the same root that we've done before? Adghasu ahlan. Remember? What are they? Mixed up dreams. Dighth is a bunch of twigs or dry grass that can fit in one's hand. A bunch of dry grass or twigs that can actually fit in your hand. And from this it's used for a bundle of confused thoughts, confused dream, unclear dream. Because in a confused dream what happens? You're here in one place at one point and then you're in another place at another point. One thing happens and all of a sudden something else happens. It's a muddle of thoughts. So, وَخُدْ بِيَدِكَ ضِغْثًا Dikhth over here refers to a bunch of twigs. And he was told that فَضْرِبْ بِهِ That strike with it. وَلَا تَحْنَثْ And do not break your oaths. What does it mean by this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to Ayyub alayhi salam the shifa. And along with that, he gave to him a fatwa. As to how to fulfill his vow. Making things easy for him and his family. Ayyub alayhi salam, when he was ill, as we learn, his family also had to leave. And it is said that at one point his wife also left. Because she could not do anything for him. She was unable to help him. So he became extremely upset. And according to other traditions, she did something because of which he became upset. So why was he upset with his wife? Either because she left, or secondly because she did something and he was very upset with that. So in that state of anger, he made a vow. If Allah cures me, then I will strike you with a hundred blows. He said this to his wife because he was extremely angry. And many times it happens, it's only natural, that when a person is ill, he becomes short-tempered. Little, little things irritate him. And especially if the illness has prolonged. And then he says such things. So he was extremely angry with his wife and he said, if Allah cures me, then I'm going to strike you with a hundred blows. And he made a vow. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured him, he had to fulfill his vow. But if he fulfilled his vow, that meant injustice against his wife. Being struck a hundred times is not fair. Especially for something that's not really a big deal. Allahu alam if what she did was a big deal or not. However, fulfilling that vow meant injustice on her. And not fulfilling that vow would be breaking a promise. So what to do in this situation? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a solution. That you should take a bundle of twigs and these twigs, a hundred in number, strike with them your wife only once. You understand? Instead of striking one hundred times, how should you do? Just take a bundle of twigs, a bundle of dry grass and to strike once. وَلَا تَحْنَثْ And do not break your oath. تَحْنَثْ is from the root letters حَانُ unsa and hints is used for a great sin. Primarily the word means a great sin. And then from this it's used for breaking an oath. Because breaking an oath is what? It's a big sin. So وَلَا تَحْنَثْ Do not break your oath. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا وَجَدْنَاهُ صَابِرًا Indeed we found him patient. نِعْمَ abdu. What an excellent servant he was. إِنَّهُ awab. Indeed he was greatly returning. Now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him this solution, it wasn't to find a loophole just to get away. But rather it was to avoid injustice. And at the same time, not break the oath. But many times we see that people look for such ways, they look for such alternates. Why? Just to avoid the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like for example, to avoid giving zakat, what do people do? They distribute the wealth among the children right when the time of zakat comes. It hasn't been one year and I don't have this much wealth anymore so I don't have to pay zakat. This is incorrect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him this solution because he was in a serious problem. If he fulfilled his vow, if he beat his wife a hundred times, just when things became better, 
just when his family returned and things became normal imagine how his entire family would feel imagine what a relationship he would have with his wife so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a solution not to let him get away but rather to avoid injustice so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him that we found him patient Ayyub alayhi salam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala found him sabir sabir over what? how was he patient? in what way was he patient? He was patient over the decree of Allah, first of all. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed illness for him, hard times for him, did he give up hope of Allah? No. Did he give up of relief from Allah? No. He still made dua. He didn't say, forget it, it's been so long. Why make dua? No. He still made dua. He still turned to Allah. Throughout his suffering, throughout his distress, he was patient. And he continued in his ibadah. It wasn't that only when he was healthy and wealthy and everything was fine, he was a devout worshipper, and as soon as things became difficult, he reduced in his worship. No. He remained a constantly obedient servant of Allah. And even though the illness had prolonged, the hard times had prolonged, he did not give up hope of Allah. So how was he patient? Over the decree of Allah. Secondly, he was patient on the ta'a of Allah, obedience to Allah. Because remember, sabr is in three ways. Over the decree of Allah. Secondly, over obedience. That in good times and bad times, he continued his worship and he prayed to Allah. And thirdly, sabr is also in staying away from disobedience. So how did he stay away from disobedience? How? that when he called out to Allah when he made dua to Allah he wasn't upset he wasn't angry he didn't give himself an excuse it's been so long I can show anger I can show some impatience no he stayed away from disobedience to Allah he stayed away from upsetting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though the illness had prolonged he did not become impatient he did not become angry so inna wajadnahu sabira ni'ma al-abd how excellent a servant he was how was he an excellent servant? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّهُ awab. Indeed, he was one greatly returning. Greatly returning to who? Allah. In good times, he worshipped Allah. In difficulty, he worshipped Allah. He prayed to Allah. إِنَّهُ awab. So how was he an excellent servant? Because he would turn to Allah regularly. We listen to the recitation. There are many things to learn from him. So Ayyub is being praised over here for his good qualities. Secondly, we also learn from this that the prophets of Allah did not possess for themselves any harm or any benefit. Because if they had power to remove any harm from themselves, then Ayyub would have avoided every distress, every difficulty that were to come his way. Isn't it so? So the prophets of Allah, they do not possess any harm or benefit for themselves thirdly we learn from these ayat about the permissibility of calling upon Allah by tawassul tawassul of what? of the state that a person is in what is tawassul? wasila wasila is basically means of attaining nearness means of getting closer to Allah so when a person makes dua in order to have his dua accepted what does he do? Like for example, he performs two rakah salah. He gives sadaqah. He gives sadaqah, he performs two rakah salah, and then right after that he makes dua. Why right after that? Why? Because when you've done a good deed, the chances of your dua being accepted are higher. This is why we should make dua after adhan. This is why we should make dua at the time of breaking our fast. So we learn from this that a person can also make dua to Allah by tawassul, by means of mentioning the state that he is in. Ayyub a.s. did he say, Oh Allah, cure me? Did he say that? No. What did he say? Anni masani shaytanu bin usbin wa adab. He just put out his state before Allah. This is the state that I am in. That's all he mentioned. Why did he mention that? 
Because when a person puts out his state before Allah, then that invites the mercy of Allah. Like Musa a.s. What did he say? Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin Faqeer. I am faqeer. I am needy. I have nothing. So when a person says, I have nothing, I am needy, then that invites the mercy of Allah. You understand? So similarly, when you're ill, when you're suffering from a problem, it doesn't mean that you have to make a very long dua saying, Ya Allah, please cure me. Please do this for me. Please do that for me. Please make that easy for me. Just say, Ya Allah, I'm in a very difficult situation. I'm in a very difficult situation. Even if you say that, that's enough. You understand? Because this invites the mercy of Allah. We learn in Surah Al-Anbiya, Ayah number 83-84, that Ayyub a.s. is mentioned, وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الضُّرُّ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ That's it. That, O oh my Lord, Dhur has touched me, harm has touched me, and you are the most merciful of those who show mercy. That's it. He didn't say, Oh Allah, cure me. Do this for me. Do that for me. Simply, أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الضُّرُّ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ Because this invites the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawassul can also be done when making dua through the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like for example, a person says, Allahumma ya ghafoor, ighfir li. You say, ya ghafoor. Why are you saying ya ghafoor? Because that invites the maghfirah of Allah. It encourages the maghfirah of Allah. Similarly, besides the names of Allah, a person can also mention the sifat of Allah. Like, Allahumma bi rahmatika astaghis. That, oh Allah, by your mercy, rahma is what? The sifa of Allah. I seek help. Allahumma bi ilmika al ghaybi wa qudratika ala al khalq. Why do you say bi ilmika al ghaybi? Ilmik is what? The sifa of Allah. Right? And qudratika ala al khalq, that is also the sifa of Allah. Why do you say that? Because that will invite the best decision in your favor. Similarly, the af'al of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can also mention that. Like for example, you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim. That, O oh Allah, send your blessings on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on his family just as you send blessings on who? Ibrahim alayhi wa You send blessings on Ibrahim, you can also do it on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do you understand? So, the names of Allah, the sifat of Allah, the af'al of Allah, all of them can be mentioned in a dua. Similarly, besides them, a person can mention his good deeds. The good deeds that he has performed. Like for example, the story of those three men, when they were in the cave, when they made dua, what did they mention? Their good deeds. Why? Because it increases the chances of the dua being accepted. Along with that, a person can also mention the state that he is in, like over here, Ayyub a.s. mentioned his state. He can mention his iman. Like in Surah Ali Imran, we learn that رَبَّنَا إِنَّنَا سَمِعْنَا مُنَادِيًا يُنَادِي لِلْإِيمَانِ أَنْ آمِنُوا بِرَبِّكُمْ فَآمَنَّا We have believed. رَبَّنَا فَغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا That we have believed, therefore forgive for us. So why is Iman mentioned? Because when you mention your Iman, then the chances of your dua being accepted are higher. So there are different things that a person can mention to increase the chances of his dua being accepted. Also we learn from these ayat about adopting means. Meaning that if a person adopts means in order to do something, that is something necessary. He should adopt means. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have caused the water to flow without him striking the ground. So many springs, so many rivers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has caused to gush forth. It's so easy for him. But Allah told Ayyub a.s. to strike his foot. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have cured Ayyub a.s. without the water even. But he told him, drink it and bathe with it. So what do we see? Means were adopted. And this is something that we also have to do. Also we learn from these ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can cause a sabab, a means that is weak to be greatly effective. And a sabab that is very strong to be ineffective. If you think about it, when he struck the ground with his foot just once, if you do that, would that cause water to gush forth? It wouldn't. 
He struck the ground only once. It was a very weak action. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so effective that water gushed out of the ground. Similarly, we see in the story of Ibrahim a.s. that something that could be very strong, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it ineffective. The people threw him in the fire. Generally, if you throw something in the fire, what would the fire do? Burn. But the fire could not burn Ibrahim a.s. So what do we see? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls all means as well. We have to adopt means without relying on the means. We adopt means relying on who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do what we can do while believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it possible. Allah will make it happen. Because sometimes we make this mistake. We think that just because we have hired someone, just because we have a particular membership, this is why everything should be possible for us. Just because we have money, everything should be possible for us. But it doesn't happen. When does it happen? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows it. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the means effective. So this is something that we have to do. Adopt the means, but don't rely on them. Rely on who? Allah. Because He controls the means as well. We also learn from these ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows on His servant more than the servant lost when the servant is patient, when he remains obedient. If you think about it, Ayyub a.s. in his illness, what did he lose? His wealth? He lost his family. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cured him, what did He give back to him? His family, but double. And when He gave him wealth, how much wealth did He give him? Just what He had before? No, more than that. We learn from a hadith in Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ said, while Ayyub ﷺ was bathing, locusts of gold fell on him. Locusts of gold fell on him. Imagine, did he lose locusts of gold before? No. But locusts of gold fell on him. Because when he was patient, Allah gave him much more in return. So, what's the point of being impatient? When you're impatient, you have lost what you had before and you're losing what you might get later. And when a person is patient, then what happens? What he has lost, okay, that's gone. But he will get much more in return from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also learn from these ayat that striking 100 times is equal to striking once with 100. Do you get it? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this fatwa. It's not a person giving it, but Allah gave this fatwa. What? That instead of striking 100 times individually, strike once with a 100. This is why some scholars, what they have said is, that if, for example, a person who has committed a crime and he deserves 100 lashes, he deserves a particular number of lashes, but he is sick, he is unwell, and his sickness is not going away. And if he is given those lashes, he will die. So what do they say? That take a hundred lashes or take a hundred sticks or whatever and then just strike once. That's it. Because the impact is different then. Imagine he was given the reward for his patience and he's also praised for his patience. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him sabit. Think about it. How many of us even call ourselves sabit? Can you say that you were very patient? Hardly any person can say that. Can other people say that about you? Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Ayyub a.s. He was sabir. He was patient. That throughout his difficulty, he did not give up hope. In the hereafter, people in Hellfire will say, Sawa'un alayna ajazirna am sabarna. It's the same whether we're patient or we're impatient. It's not going to make a difference. But in this dunya, if a person is patient, and if he's impatient, is there a difference? Is there a difference? A huge difference. If a person is patient, it will bring him so much reward, so many blessings, more than what he lost. And if a person is impatient, he has lost dunya and akhirah. 